Hello YouTube friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dennis and in today's video, we're going to be doing a remake of my video that I created six months ago in this channel. It's called How to Automate Tasks with uh, Airtable.ai. It's a video that a lot of people has been asking me to redo or to remake because of the, the video quality in this video it was terrible back then. I apologize. So I figured I would create a new video for you guys in today's video and it's going to have the new and the latest features that a table has introduced since I created that video. So hopefully this is two times better than the original. So hopefully it will help you out and it's much better quality than the original one. So, so yeah, I'm going to recreate this video. And the first thing I want to do is I want to cover what a table.ai is. So if you're not really familiar with what a table is, it's essentially a spreadsheet type of application where you can create records similar to Google Sheet and some of the spreadsheet platform that is. So the main competitor for AI table is Airtable. So you get a lot of similarities in that front for what the platform has to offer. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a table is. If, if you're brand new and have no idea what a table is, I'm just going to go through and just kind of explain a little bit how it works. So you can create, organize your data using AI, you can do some collaboration with it as well, since you can create your space and you can have a data sheet that you can collaborate with other people. You can also do some automation as well. It has a built-in connection with Zapier, Make, Pavli, Active Pieces, Albato. Some of the major API tools available that's out there, they do have an API offering as well, which allows you to integrate with a table from other applications or platforms, not just the tools that I mentioned here. So which is pretty cool. So it has, allows you to have some flexibility if you want to build it and include it in your application. So that's also a possibility and something that you can do since it has the built-in API integration. All right. So there's also a, a bunch of different things as well. There's some uh, data transformation. There's also some forms where you can allows you to submit data from within your in internal users, or you can also share uh, a, a form that can be accessed by a public user or an anonymous user. I'm using it a lot for some forms that I want to have users submit data for, for instance, like a newsletter to gather some lists or email lists. So there's a lot of use cases as far as utilization of form and what you can do with it. You can also build your AI agent chatbot, which allows you to train your chatbot or agents based on your knowledge base that have you created within your data sheet. Before we get started in this video, I want to do a rundown of all the things that we're going to be covering in this video. Uh, we're going to be covering the basics of Airtable.ai uh, in relation to uh, doing an, an automation with active pieces. We're going to be covering the basics of Airtable with focus on the automation aspect of it. I'm going to be showing you guys the basics just in case you're new to a table and you're trying to be productive with getting started on the tool. So I'm going to be showing you guys the ins and out, including the different field types that is in a table. We're also going to be covering some of the formulas. There's quite a bit of formulas in a table. So we're just going to be focusing on the basics as what can be useful for automation aspects. We're going to be covering some of the a table automation as well. Uh, if you don't know already, there's an automation feature that is built in with a table and it's something that you can use to also do some automation with. So we're going to be covering some of that as well as just kind of show you to get familiarized with that aspect of it. So you can have that as an option if you want to do an automation that way with an a table. In today's automation, we're going to be creating an RSS aggregator where we're going to be scraping uh, news articles from an RSS feed. Uh, we're going to be taking those, that URL that we get from an RSS feed, and then we're going to be doing a web scraping uh, using Firecrawl. If you're not familiar with Firecrawl, it's essentially a platform where you create a markdown a, or a structured data based on that website. So you can do a web scraping on either the entire website or a single page. So I'm going to be so showing you guys how to set it up. So here's a, a very big basic example of it. So it gives you a structure right here where it gives you an array of all the different pages that you've scraped. If you're trying to web scrape the entire website, but I'm going to be showing you guys in details how to set it up, including setting up and accessing their platform using an API and integrating it that way. So we're going to be integrating and setting it all up within active pieces. So here's what we're going to be building up today, which is this automation right here. We're going to be taking in an RSS feed and we're going to be pulling the data. 
which we're going to be capturing the URL. We're going to be web scraping the data using Firecrawl, and then we can feed it into AI so that we can clean up that content, which we're then we're going to be storing inside a table. So that's going to be what's in store today. Okay, let's let's walk you through the uh, the flowchart that I created here, so you can kind of see the relationships between the different features or the different things that you can add inside your A table. So for instance, right here on the top, which is the data sheet, which is the basis for all the different things that you create inside the A table. So think of a data sheet as the spreadsheet. You can create uh, multiple uh, views inside of a data sheet. Uh, you can also create a new data sheet based on existing templates. Uh, templates is package a set of things uh, inside of a table. Uh, including a view, uh, including a form, including a widget, anything that you can think of, you can package it into a template that you can create a data sheet with. So it, it contains all the different columns or different fields that you can use within your app. And so you can get started with creating workflow, whatever the template is designed for. So for instance, if you're creating a data sheet based off an existing CRM template, right? And you don't want to create a new CRM from scratch. I just want to create from an existing one, you can do that. And then you can just customize the, the data sheet that's been created based on your preference once you've created the data sheet. So that's how essentially how it works. And conversely, you can create a template based on an existing data sheet. So a, you can create a template from an existing folder that, that contains a data sheet and some views and some charts or whatever. And then you can create that into a template so that you can use that to create uh, other workflows you can create it in the future. So let's say you want to recreate the same type of uh, flow or workflow for your organization again, again in the future. So you don't have to worry about creating everything from scratch that can be useful for that as well. So let's go ahead and take a look and dissect some of these things in a little bit more details. So from a data sheet, you're given a grid view or a view by default, which is the view that you, you start out, start out with when you add a data sheet. And from here, you can modify it, you can add columns or fields, and you can sort it however you want. And you can create multiple views as well, which I'm going to be demonstrating in a little bit how to do. The next thing that you can do with the data sheet is you can create an AI agent. So with AI agent, you have two options. The first one is a chat agent, which is if, if you're familiar with uh, ChatGPT, it allows you to do a generic type of queries and responses. So you can ask any type of generic questions and the LLM, depending on what LLM you choose, it's going to provide answer in a trained data set, whatever that LLM is trained on. So that's what a chat agent is. A query agent is a little bit more different as it's specific to the content. The AI agent is trained on, so you can train it based on your data sheet uh, content, and it's only going to pull the data based on the, the content that you provided which is inside of your data sheet. It can't really pull any response outside of the trained data. This is why it's called a QA agent. So from here, you can see here that the QA agent is an AI agent powered by the RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation Technology and it excels in providing efficient question and answer services by combining informative or information retrieval and natural language uh, generation techniques. So that's what it is, okay? So I'm going back to the data sheet, within data sheet, you can create a, a form where it allows for an ex internal or external users to submit uh, new records into your data sheet. Uh, you can create a form based on uh, whatever fields sets that you have or you want to be available as part of your form. Uh, you can uh, customize your form uh, however uh, you may see fit based on the fields that you have on your form. And you can customize it you can add uh, branding and so on and so forth uh, i'm going to be showing you guys here in a little bit how to customize and create a new form as well uh, we're also going to be highlighting the automation aspect inside of a table so if you want to create uh, your own automation within a table you can also do that so i'm going to be showing you guys how to set up the automation within a table not just uh, inside of active pieces so you have some flexibility and different options if you want to create either your automation within a table or within active pieces. And lastly, I'm going to be showing you guys uh, in a little bit. I'm not going to go in too deep into the widgets, but a widget is essentially a new feature that they introduced that allows you to visualize uh, your data. They also have a script widget, which I'm going to be discussing in a little bit on how to use, which essentially allows you to modify 
your existing uh, fields and columns based on set of criteria. So let's go ahead and take a look in a bit more details, the basics of a table. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we're gonna be building today. So I've created this uh, data sheet and an agent within a table. You can see here, I have an agent right here and also some forms and some agents. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this in a little bit, just to kind of show you what we're gonna be building today. So I have the title of the article here, the source URL, which we're gonna be uh, pulling from this RSS feed. And we're gonna be including the date published. And also the most important piece of this is we're gonna be grabbing the content as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of these script content so you can see here that based on this url right here we're able to just extract the main contents of this article and remove all the different html fragments that associated with usually when you scrape contents we were able to remove the html fragments that are usually associated with web scraping websites and articles so we're able to extract uh, some of the, the article details uh, so using an AI, AI prompt and feeding it into AI, we're able to extract just the main uh, content uh, of the article. And we were able to remove all the different uh, parts of the article that was not really relevant to what we want. So we're able to extract this information. So that's what we're gonna be building today. We're gonna be building everything in active pieces. So just to kind of show you what we're building today, I'm just gonna give you a high level before we jump into anything, just to kind of give you a taste of what today's video is about. So. We're going to be pulling the news from the uh, RSS feed and then we're going to be doing some checking within a table, which we're going to be using the filters so you can have an idea how to use filters in a table. And then we're going to be uh, grabbing the URL, which gonna, we're going to be creating different sets of we're going to be using a lot of code in this video just to create and grab the, the URL of the RSS feed. Uh, a lot of these uh, news feeds, especially Google News, are using a some sort of redirect so uh, we're using some code uh, to be essentially get and retrieve the URL for that particular website. And then we're going to be using Firecrawl. If you're not familiar with Firecrawl, essentially a tool that allows you to do a web scrape on a website, whether it's a single page or for the entire website, and it gives the, the data or the content back in a structured data format. So that's what we're going to be using today to do web scraping. And this code right here is I'm going to be showing you guys in a little bit how to set it up so you can understand it and how to use it and learn how to use it within your own automation scenario. And then from there, we're going to be do some validation as well. And then we're going to be using Straco to essentially extract uh, the data and the main key points from the article that we've scraped so we can clean it up without having any of the uh, unnecessary uh, content that's usually available when you're doing a web scraping on a generic website. This type of automation can be used for any type of data, regardless of uh, whether it's paywalled or it's whether it's structured in a specific way. So this is essentially going to work with any website that you can think of that you want to do a web scraping on. And then lastly, we're going to be storing those data that we scrape from the RSS feed using Firecrawl and AI. And then we're going to be uh, storing that in a table. All right. So rather than going through the documentation, I just want to do a hands-on demonstration. So can you, so you can learn how to use a table in a in a more practical sense. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a table here. So when you first log into a table, so this is essentially what you're going to see. You're going to have the the teams and the the pins right here. Right, so you're gonna see all the different uh, nodes. Uh, this is what a table refers to when you say a node. A node can be anything. It could be a data sheet. It could be a view. It could be a dashboard or a form. So that's what a a node is about. So let's go ahead and and start from the beginning here and take a look at uh, explain what is space is about. So when you first create an account, you're gonna be given one space, and you can have up to ten space. When you create an AA table account, are you given one space? And from here, you can click on the top left hand of the, the website here. And you can see here that I have access to these spaces. I have one out of 10. So I can create multiple spaces here. So a space is a way of adding organization to your own account. So for instance, if you have an account or a company that has multiple 
departments. You can think of each department as a space where multiple individuals can be working in a single space that they only have access to. And obviously you can have different users allowed for that sp space by modifying the permissions and inviting that user to another space. And similarly, you can also join additional spaces here as well, which your join space is going to be showing up here. So if I've joined or someone invited me to their space, I'm going to be able to easily just switch to that space quickly by clicking on the space that I have access to here. So you can see, you're going to be seeing the spaces here. So let's go ahead and just start with my space and each space has its own allocated uh, numbers of nodes uh, and things that you can do with it. So whatever your plan is, is going to be limited based on the space that you have. So each of those limitations is going to be within a space. So how many nodes can you create or how many records can you create per space is on a space level. Okay. Next thing that we, talk, we can talk about is the add button here. So if you want to create uh, a data sheet, you can create a, a new data sheet up here by clicking on this add button. Uh, and you can also uh, add a new form as, as well as some other stuff such as dashboard and some agent. Some of these things relies on a data sheet to get started. So if you don't have any data sheet, uh, you will have to create a data sheet for you to create a new form or, or whatever that you need to create here, including a custom page. You can also import from an Excel. So if you want to import some of those columns and data from an existing Excel or CSV type of file, then you can click on this import from Excel as well. Here's what I was talking about where I can create from a template. So you can create uh, a new data sheet here from an existing template. So you can create it from here or you can also click on this templates right here where you'll see all the available templates that's available for you so that you can use to cre create your workflow so you can be productive when using a table. So you can see here the, there's different uh, categories that you can choose from. Uh, there's the hot recommended where you can see here the different uh, templates that I'm guessing is uh, popular among the users that people are utilizing uh, more. So you can see here the uh, product release plan. You can also see here that there's a content marketing for SEO. Uh, so if we click on one of these, for instance, the car content marketing for SEO. So you can see here that it already has a folder. So this is a folder right here on a top level. So you can see here that there's a folder which is content marketing for SEO and it has a built-in dashboard, which is pointing to an existing data sheet. It also has a the data sheet here as well, which includes all the different fields that you see here, including the content topic, the related SEO keywords, publication platform, and so on and so forth. Uh, it also has the Gantt chart view as part of this data sheet. And it also has a Kanban board, which I'm assuming is for managing the content when you have an SEO agency or when you have an agency that's focused on SEO. So you have a content Kanban here and you also have a gallery view. So if you have an image uh, that you're embedding as part of your data sheet, uh, you can easily view those uh, images uh, based on this uh, gallery view that they provided. So there's another uh, view here, which I'm assuming is a separate view, which is SEO key uh, keywords and also another data sheet which which is i'm assuming is tied to the other data sheet that you've seen so we can go ahead and take a look at this one by using this template so let's go ahead and, and click on use templates and then we can add this to either the team space or we can add this on a private so let's go ahead and add it one option that you can see here that you use the data in the template so by default, you can use an existing data that they've provided, or you can start from scratch. When you create a data sheet based on an existing template, you can have a basically an empty data sheet with no data in it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the data in a template so we can have some data to work with and have the dashboard pre-populated with data so we can see a different visualization tool that's already been added as part of this template. So let's go ahead and click OK. After a few seconds, you get here a folder which gets added inside of my space. So you can see here the same one that we've seen in the preview. You can see here that there's a, a folder right here with an icon. So if you want to change the icon for a folder, you just click on this icon right here. And this will allow you to pick from an existing set of icons that you have available. You see here, I have an icon right here. You can do a search um, uh, writing, for instance. And this will bring up the writing icon that you can attach to this. So that's how they were able to, 
to change it. So if you want to change it to something else, such as this pencil right here, I can just go ahead and change that to a pencil. So we can open up this folder by clicking on this icon on the left hand side. And you can see here we can inspect it by going through each one. You can see here that this consists of a dashboard that consists of uh, multiple widgets as part of it. You can see here that each of these uh, widgets can be configured uh, separately. You can see here what uh, what type of uh, data can be shown in this widget and also what type of description uh, can be can be set here. You can see here that this is set to count records based on this uh, competition level as a data source. You can see here that there's different data sources that you can pick from. So that's the dashboard right here. And the next one would be the, the grid view or the view, right? So you can see here that this one has been named to all. I'm assuming this is unfiltered version of the data sheet where you can see all the different entries. And then you can switch to the same data sheet, but within a different view, you can see here that there's 10 hidden fields within this Gantt chart view. You can see here there's 10 hidden fields. And then you can also, there's also some hidden graphic field here as well. So you can see here that only the content topic, persona, status, and content type has been enabled for this view. And then there's 10 hidden fields. You can see here all the different fields that's been hidden. There's no there's no filtering or anything on this view. And you can see here that this, there's, there's some also some settings that you can configure as well if you want to select uh, based on what dates uh, to, to do a Gantt chart on. Uh, moving along, let's go ahead and go to the Kanban, Kanban view, uh, which is a way of uh, organizing your content so that uh, you can move uh, the different records into different states uh, within your within your view. You can see here there's like multiple status and you can drag, if I want to drag this content across and go move it to a researching state, then I can just drag this and see here that now the short term rental is within the researching state for this Kanban board. Next thing we can look at is the gallery view. You can see here that the gallery basically has all the information. Each of the records within this data sheet has a image associated with it. And you see here that we can inspect it. If you go to all, let's go ahead and inspect one. You can see here there's like an image attached to this one right here to each record. There's also a checked image as well, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit. But just to kind of see like all the different things that you can add and the template can consist of all these different variations and different views that you can add to it. So you will just have all the different things that you need to just get started. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the different fields that you can use within uh, a table. Let's go ahead and look at the, the data sheet here, which has all the different records. Okay, so the way you can add a data sheet is within a folder. You can create a data sheet from there. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning so you can have an understanding of this. So within this folder, I can go ahead and do it. Click on this plus and I create a new data sheet. And from here, I can just rename this to something else. For instance, uh, test data sheet. So this could be anything that you want. By default, you'll be given this field name of title, right? Options and attachments. So you have to kind of think about this beforehand. When you first create your data sheet, you have to make sure that you have to kind of think this through because the first column is going to be your unique column, right? So when you first uh, create a, a new data sheet, you're going to be given this title and you can name this whatever you want. We can also change it to a, a different field type. All right. You can set whatever settings you want, but the only problem with this, you can't really move this around, right? So this is really uh, static at this point. Uh, you can only change the name and the type, but you can't move this around. So you have to make sure that you kind of think this through and what you're going to be adding when you first uh, create this data sheet. So in our case, the, the title is fine. You can have it as an ID as well. If, if you want to have it a unique uh, identifier for this uh, record, right? So that could be that or the title. Let's go ahead and, and make this a title again. And then made this a single line text. So. Aside from single line text, which is obviously for single line uh, type of text, you can use single line text for a very short uh, type of text. But if you need to use it for, for big paragraphs or for long type of contents, then you need to switch to a long text. Another one that you can also use a, is a number. If you want to limit a user to use a specific number with certain pre precision and uh, units of a measurement, then you're going to use a number. Same thing with currency. If you want to just 
put a constraint and to only allow currency information within a field, then you can change it to currency. There's also the percent and there's also a date as well, where you can set it to use a time zone, right? You can do a 12 hour format or a 24 hour format. And you can also use your existing time zone. If you want to use a specific time zone, you can use, you can set it as well. You can see here that I can display the time zone when I create a date within this field. Another thing that I can also toggle is when, if I want to pre-fill this with information every time I create a new record. So this will be like a timestamp information. So I can also toggle this option right here where, where I can autofill a uh, creation time when record is created. Uh, there's some other setting here as well, which I'm going to be discussing when we get to the forms section of this video. But those are the options that you get when you have a date field type. And the next thing that we're going to be looking at is the URL. So the the URL is a very unique one where it allows you to add a URL and then you can use that to navigate to the website pretty easily. I don't really use this as much. I prefer a single line text for, for URL type of scenario as it kind of does the same thing. It doesn't really overcomplicate it. But if you have a need to just format your URL a certain way, I think this would be a good approach. Like I mentioned, a, a single line text would suffice for some of the URL stuff. A phone number, if you want to limit the field to a phone number, same thing with an email. So you just limit whatever can be set onto this one. So the next one is the auto number. Like I previously mentioned, you can do like auto number. So if you specify this field right here as an ID, you can have an auto number here where it is going to generate an automatically generated number for you every time you created a new record. So every time you create a new record, it's going to be this field is going to be auto populated with that ID, right? So that's that for the auto number that you can use. And also the formula, which we're going we're to be discussing in a little bit. So there's numerous amount of formulas that you can use with an AI table, mostly for displaying and, and calculating purposes. But you can also use formulas within active pieces for filtering purposes, which I'm going to be showing you guys a little bit how to do a filtering so that you can only retrieve certain records that fits that based on that formula they've provided. So the, some of the formulas that you can use, such as sum, where you can uh, do a, a sum of all the different columns that you have uh, within a record. Uh, average where you can you can pass in multiple uh, fields or columns and it's going to take an average and it's going to just put that in in a single field other things that you can can be useful here is the min and max if you want to get the minimum and maximum the run up the, the even odd converting to a number for instance if you want to do that um, there's also one here where you can convert a string to a number that can be useful as well Concatenate. So this can be useful if you want to concatenate a string when you want to combine certain strings. For instance, if you want to combine first name and last name and so on and so forth, that can be useful for that. So a find is if you're trying to find a text or a string within a text, and then that's going to be based on the, the location of that. So if you find anything that's going to be greater than zero, otherwise it's going to be zero. Same thing with a search. Okay, so search is similar to find, except that if you do a search and if you don't find anything within a, a, a text, you're just basically going to get an empty string as opposed to getting a result for it. If you want to get a length of a column or a field, if you want to get the how many characters, you can grab a, a number of characters from left or right. You can use the left and right, upper, uppercase, lowercase, getting, converting, uh, checking if a, an argument is a text can be handy. So for instance, if you're, if you're trying to determine whether a number is a string type of value, then you can do a check. So there's a lot of function here, like the if statement, which the if logic is very useful if you're trying to, uh, trying to get a value. So for instance, if you're doing a if else type of logic, where if this is a uh, number is greater than zero, then you can return a string and then otherwise it's just gonna, it's just gonna, you can default it to something else. So there's a lot of things here that you can do. There's some date functions where you can grab today's date. You convert uh, the date. You can determine how many days from today's date. You can choose a lot of these functions. You can extract the year, get the month, get the day, get the hour, get the minute, get the second. So all these different things that you can do within, right? And obviously you also have access to the record ID, which can be useful if you're trying to automate where we can easily uh, 
pull the record information based on the record ID. So all the records within uh, a table has a unique identifier, which is the record ID. If you want to just pull a single record within a table for a specific based on the ID, then the record ID would be something that you're going to be using for your automation. So that's that for, for the different fields. So one thing I also want to cover is the attachment. You've seen it earlier in one of the data sheets that was included as part of the template. We're able to attach an image right here. So you can see here that I can attach an image. So you can essentially use a table as your content management software. So if you want to use this for keeping track of your blog content, for instance, this can be useful for that as well. So if you're managing a content, if you want to store your feature images, if you have different images within this, you can store uh, multiple attachment. And this could be something that you can use to store uh, your blog content in, right? So aside from uh, the content type, you can also uh, set the status. Uh, you can also set this to a, a user within uh, your space. So you can see here that I can attach uh, myself as a writer for this record. Uh, same thing with the the work doc. For instance, they, there's a deliverable field right here, which is a work doc. So this is a Notion alternative. So if you're used to managing your content within Notion, so this gives you a similar feel of similar to a Notion database where you can type in your text or your heading, and then you can have you can, you can do a forward slash, and it will give you a rich text type to, type of format where you have your paragraph, and also you can include a heading, right? So you can have a heading right here, heading one, and then you can have your uh, additional text here as well. So a lot of the things that you can do uh, within Notion, you can do here, uh, such as image. Uh, you can you can embed a video and image as well, um, as well as you can embed a code block. So if you have you have some documentation that you want to do, you can also include a code block here, so you, so you can easily just identify the code uh, pieces of that uh, particular documentation that you're trying to create. And there's also the divider, this code to do list, which is kind of cool. You can do a to do list here. We can do a check. So kind of visualize like what the things that if you want to do a visualization of the rich content that you're at attaching as part of this record, so you can go further and enhance it by adding this workable docs that's within here. So from here, you can get out of this one. So the next thing we can look at is the automation. So the automation is built in for each of the data sheet. If you click on the top right right here where it says automation, you can create an automation for each data sheet. So for instance, right here, I can create a new automation by clicking on that automation. And then from here, you can have the same type of logic or type of if this in that type of scenario where you can add a trigger and then within a trigger, you can also add additional action on top of that. So for instance, if we want to add a trigger, you have this, all these different options right here. So when a form has been submitted, you want to create an action based on that specific trigger. When a record matches a condition, which is why you can set it to a data sheet and then you can set a specific type of criteria. So for instance, here I selected this data sheet, right? So when a content or a specific, whatever field uh, that you choose contains a specific data or information, you can trigger this automation to do just that based on this type of trigger. And then from here, let's go ahead and take a look at the other ones as well. When every time you create a new record, you can do an automation on top of that as well. And then uh, lastly here, you can also do a schedule base. So a schedule base is the same thing with active pieces where you can create an automation based on a schedule basis. So if you want to do an automation on a daily basis, or if you want to do per hour or per week or per month, whenever you decide to do automation for this, you can set a schedule for this. And this is going to be deducted based on the plan that you have in your account. So however many automation that you can do per month is based on the account that you have. So from here, once you have the, the schedule in place, let's say I, I chose this automation schedule based on starting from January every month or every day, right? So if I do a schedule every day, starting at uh, midnight, you can see here that it even tells you when is it going to come up next? When is it going to happen next? It's going to give you a preview of when the, auto the automation is going to run next, right? It's going to be UTC minus seven. And then, and then from here you can add a then action. This is what you want to happen when a specific trigger has occurred. So if this schedule arrives, you want to then do some automation on top of that, right? So for instance, in this case, 
Airtable has a few options. They do have a send web, web request, send message to Slack, send emails. And then there's like different option, apps here that has been added as well. If you're familiar with these tools, you can do that. So you can just send a web request right here, which then allows you to send, make a, an HTTP call to a webhook or an API of your choosing. So it could be an, an active pieces or it could be it could be anywhere. You can change the request method to get, post, patch, and delete. So the, the most common request method, I think the put is the only one that's missing here, but you have all the different request method that, that you need uh, to enable this webhook. And then from here, you can specify your request address, which is the webhook uh, URL. And then lastly here, you can include a header as well. If your API requires some sort of header or type of authorization, to be part of that request, you can also include that value here. So you can type in authorization, right? If you wanna do authorization request and then bear token. And then you can include your API key if you have it. So that's how it works as far as automation is concerned. So far we talked about the automation, we've talked about the uh, different field types, uh, the templates. Let's go ahead and take a look at the widgets here. So by clicking on the widget next to the uh, automation and the API, you can create a widget, uh, right? So based on this data sheet, you can create a new chart. Uh, you can create a summary widget, a pivot table, a funnel chart. You can also import your data sheets uh, from Airtable. So if you're coming from Airtable and if you're trying to migrate all your existing data and fields into Airtable, AI table, then you can install, install this widget, which allows you to basically migrate everything. Uh, we can also migrate from uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So whether you have an Excel, Excel uh, spreadsheet or XLS or CSV files, you can add it and import it to your, your current table. So you can install that widget here. Uh, you can install a chart here. You can see here that there's some visualization tool that you can include as part of this. So you can see here that once we added that chart widget, you can see here that there's a visualization that comes up on the right hand side. Uh, you can see here that the, uh, the chart is essentially set to the, the title or the content topic that you have here on the, your data sheet. So you can modify this and you can configure your chart to essentially just point to any type of data that you have within that data sheet. You can configure the X axis and you can configure a Y, y axis, right? You can count a field, you can count a field or a count on the records that you have for that particular title in this particular case. So you can configure this however you want. So that's an example of how the widget looks like. Uh, there's also a special widget here that you can also include. So you can he see here that you can add multiple widgets into a data sheet here. You can see here that I have a summary here, some pivot table, if that's something that's useful to you. A special one that I've, I just kind of recently learned while navigating a table is this thing called script which is considered a widget within a table. So you can see here that you can attach a code, which looks like it's fun. So you can edit this code and you can run it. So by default right now, you have a default output right here, which you can use for debugging purposes. If you want to the output of the contents within your data sheet, for instance. So you can see here that you can do a programmatic widget where you can calculate certain things. You can, you can have finer control of what you can do within the different fields that you have within data sheets based on certain criteria you can set a field to a specific type of text by running this the script widget so which is kind of looks like it's fun so you can see here that i'm able to do a hello world here so it's just a simple a script that we have here i'm probably going to be doing a separate tutorial on this specific feature as this is going to be outside of the scope of this video but just to kind of show that this is option is available for you to use within a table within the data sheet so you're going to go ahead and expand this in this one you can cre create a setting so from here you can rename a widget uh, you can create and, and send the information here to a dashboard if you want so let's go ahead and close this one so that's what a widget is the next thing that i want to highlight and focus on is the form so let's go ahead and take a look at the form so you can create a form within a data sheet here so you can see here based on this view i can create a form right so let's go ahead and create a form from this view. So you can see here out of the box, when you first create a form out of an existing view of a data sheet, you're going to see all the different fields that you have available for that form. So the only way to limit the different fields that you can show in the form is to create a different view with a specific list of fields that you want available to your form. 
So in this case, I can send this form to someone and have someone fill out this form, right? If you're happy with the form that you see here, you can end it from here once you're satisfied with this form. You can also modify the settings, right? So you can remove the cover. You can see here that there's a cover on the top. You can remove that or you can modify it uh, according to your branding if you have a certain brand that you want to add here. So if, if you want to remove it, you can remove it. Um, you can also add a logo here. Uh, I can also remove it. I can also remove the index here. You can see here that there's an index for each field. Uh, like we can go ahead and remove that as well if you just want to clean that up. And there's also the branding, which at the bottom you can see here that there's a branding powered by AATable.ai, which you can also remove. Because you can see here the different options that you have. Right now, it's probably not the ideal form that you, you want to send to your user because it's, it contains all the different form fields and options that you have in a particular data sheet. So in order for you to clean this up, so I'm going to go ahead and remove this and confirm it. So let's go back into my content management. So I want to create a new view based on this particular data sheet. So let's go ahead and create a new view. So like I previously mentioned, you can create multiple views on top of a data sheet. So by default, you get this all our default grid view right here, which you can then further customize. So let's go ahead and create a new view here that we can use for our form. So let's go ahead and add a, a new grid view here. You see here that I can do a plus view and then let's, it's going to go ahead and create a new grid view, which is then named a grid. So I can name this however I want. So I can go ahead and click on this one and name it to something else. I can name this to view, form view, which I know for a fact that I'm going to be using this specific to view, which is the reason why I renamed it to that form view. So now from here, I can hide fields that I, that I don't want to be visible in, inside my form, right? So I can remove certain things such as, for instance, the related SEO keywords. I want to remove that from the view. I also want to remove the persona. I want to remove the persona, maybe the status. I don't want the status to be there and also the writer, maybe the header, header image can also be removed, need other image. And then I don't want the different dates to be available. So I just want to be streamlined as possible when I'm giving this form to someone. I just want the, the different fields that I want the user to be able to submit and remove the other fields that I don't want to be submitted by the user. So based on this form view, I can go ahead and create a new form based on this one. So I can either create it from here, right? So I can either create from here and add a form, which I can then point to that form view that I just added, right? So from here, I can just create a new form. So now when you create this new form, now it's tailored against the form view that I created, which is have all the different fields just set for this specific view. So now I can do the other settings that I want, such as to remove the end, removing the branding. And I have the form that I can basically send to someone. So all I have to do is just share this to, to another person and create a public link. And this will be available on this uh, URL right here. So anyone who has access to this form can basically just submit uh, this form anonymously or they need to log in to submit. So you have different options here as how, how you want the user to be able to submit data to this form. Uh, you can also limit how many times a person can submit to this form, right? So you can, if you enable need login to submit, you can also enable how many times they can submit, right? So you can either submit, you can have a no limit type of submission or you can have a submit once only type of submission. So, which is kind of cool. And then from here, anytime you create or change the field settings, it's going to be reflected on the actual view that this form is set to. So for instance, for the content, content type, if I change this to a type, for instance, this is going to change the actual field name into the original view. Just in case you need to change the field name, just to keep in mind that whatever you set the field name here is going to be reflected in the actual view that you created for the status sheet. So just to prove that, let's go ahead and change it. And let's go back to content management and let's go back to form view. You see here the type has been converted, changed to type, not content type. Next thing I want to cover is API. So you can see here when you're working against a data sheet, each of the data sheet that you're working on uh, allows you to communicate to it via an API, right? So in here, you can see here that I can click on this API, which brings up this API panel. So here from here, you can see all the different fields that's available for this view. 
So if I want to go back to a different view where which has all the different fields, I can go ahead and click on the API here as well, which will toggle and bring all the different fields that's available that I can use and consume within that endpoint. So from here, I can get multiple records, right? I can do some pagination where I can, well, gives you some data here, right? So when you make a request to this endpoint, you can see here the different things that it, it returns, such as the type of the code, whether the message has been successful or the retrieval has been successful. Also the amount of that's within the amount of records that you're retrieving, the page number, page size, and all the different records with the record ID and the all the different relevant fields within this row of records. So you can also add records as well in this API, update records, delete records, and also upload attachments as well. As you're working through this, you can see here on the last tab where it says upload attachment, you can see here that there's different SDKs that you can use. So within curl, obviously you can create a regular HTTP request where you can pass in your API token using this uh, command. You pass in your, your form data and then you're, you're passing your, your path to your file. So that's how you upload it. Uh, another uh, way you can also do this is using the SDK that's available in JavaScript as well, as well as Python, which they give you some code here to allow you to upload an attachment and attach it to your, to your record. Right. That's how you work with a table through an API. And this is available within ActiveBasis. So you don't have to worry about having to deal with having to work with API and having to know how to make a request via an API to access the AA table within ActiveBasis. So everything's available for you via the AA table piece that's available already. So that's that for the API and something that you can use if you're working with a separate app, right? If you're, separate, if you're using an app outside of ActiPieces or Make or Zapier, you'll need, obviously you'll need API access, which you do have access to when you create a data sheet. Just to come, something to keep in mind. So last thing I wanna talk about in a table before we do an automation is let's go ahead and take a look at the organizational structure here. So you can see here by default, when I created a data sheet based on an existing template, you can see here that there's a hierarchy, right? So there's a, the top level of the space. I have this content mar marketing for SEO. It created a folder on the, the parent directory of that space. If you want to organize content or nodes in a certain way, I can be more complex as I can by adding folders inside of that folder. So I can go ahead and create a new folder here. So let's say I want to create a new folder within the content marketing for SEO. SEO. Let's say I want to do a child a folder. So you can create all these more complex organizational uh, structure within uh, a table uh, and you can have different uh, things uh, organized in a certain way. So if you have a way of organizing your things, for instance, if you want to use this for a second brain, for instance, like you want to store your contents here, you can create multitudes of folders within a folder, right? So I can, I can even create from within a child folder, I can go ahead and create another folder within that. And that can be a child folder, child folder too, for instance. And then from here, you can create and include additional folders and additional nodes underneath this folder that you created. I just want to touch on that and how you can organize your space a little bit more by adding these multiple folders. And obviously by clicking on, on the left-hand side, you can add icons specific to that folder. So you can easily identify that folder, just kind of looking at it from when you first open up your space, you can easily identify what that folder includes and so on and so forth. All right, so the last thing I want to touch on here is to create an AA agent. So, so let's go ahead and create an AA agent based on the SEO keywords, our content management table right here, right, that I created. So underneath this content marketing for SEO, let's go ahead and create an AA agent by doing a plus here. And then we can do a new AA agent right here, which is still in beta. At this point, uh, you have two options. One is to create an QA agent where it's like I previously mentioned is a QA type of uh, response uh, type of AA agent where the, the agent is going to pull information from the, the content that's available within your data sheet versus a chat where it's just going to be generic type of a agent where it's going to be trained on data that's not really specific to your content. 
So that's the major difference between these two, depending on what type of style of agent that you're trying to create. Let's go ahead and take a look at a agent inside a table. Keep in mind that this feature is still in beta. It's still not a fully flushed feature. So that's something that you need to keep in mind when you're working with this feature within a agent. But let's go ahead and take a look. So within the YouTube demos, I have another folder here called a table, which has the a news, which we're going to be using in the automation today. So you can see here, I have the title, the source URL, the date published, the content and the email. So let's go ahead and take a look at the title real quick. So the title is a single line text, which is identifying the article that we're going to be adding into this, this data sheet. The source URL is where the URL is going to be coming from. I have a single line text as, as a URL field type. And the next one here is the date publish, which I have it set as to include the time and in, include the time in the time zone. I also have it set where it, this information when I create this record automatically. And then the content would be a, a long uh, text field type, which will include the article itself. So you can see here when we examine one of these records, you can see here that this is a pretty short one. If you go to some of these articles, you can see here that some of these articles are pretty lengthy and it has all the different details, including the article. In addition, we're also going to be including the emailed column. So you can see here that the field type is a checkbox, which could only be a one or a zero, yes or no type of response. I see here I can change the icon as well if I want to. So this will be displayed when you check on this field. So this is the makeup for the A table data sheet that we're going to be working against with. So let's go ahead and add a new agent here. Within this AA table folder, let's go ahead and do it and click on this plus sign where we can add a new AA agent here. So let's go ahead and add a new AA agent. You see here that I have a new AA agent too, which I can rename it to something else. You can see here that I'm, we're going to be prompted to use either the QA and the chat. So you can see here that I can choose either one of those. So we're going to go with a Q&A since we're going to be uh, using our content to train this uh, AA agent. So we're going to go and click that. Click next on that one. And the next thing, next step that we're going to be uh, doing is we're going to be selecting the data sheet. So we're going to go ahead and drill down to the YouTube demos and inside of a table, this is AI news data sheet. And then from here, you can select from a particular view that, uh, that you want. So here I'm just, I'm just look, select the default one, which doesn't have any uh, uh, filtering inside of it. So let's go ahead and click OK. And from here, uh, this is probably going to take uh, a minute or two, depending on how many records you have in this uh, data sheet. In my case, I think I do have about 49 records that I, or 56 records that I'm working with. So it can tr take a little bit of time depending on, on really how much you have. So in our case, it only took like a few seconds since I only have about 56 uh, records in it. So when you first get started on building your AI agent, you can see here that once it's been trained, on the content for us you can see here that there's a few questions that is that's ready to go that is based on the content that the agent has been trained on in this case how much funding did he be at race in recent funding round so you can click on one of those questions and the agent is going to respond accordingly specific to that so you can see here that there's an additional questions that you can also ask so it's giving you some hints as to what type of questions you can ask based on your content that you provided when you ask a questions uh, within uh, this AA agent of Q&A, you just have to make sure that the question uh, that you're asking is tailored to whatever content you're asking. Otherwise, the agent is not going to have an idea of how to respond to your question. So for instance, if I asked it about certain news, what is the latest AI news, just to kind of keep it generic. So the agent could respond to that question uh, just depending on how much content do you have and how much data it can work with. So in this case, it was able to pull something based out of the generic uh, question. So the latest AI news includes information about crypto mining, pivoting to private infrastructure for AI companies, China's homegrown AI models expanding and Google experts warning about AI distorting, distorting reality. So you can see here that it's pulling all that information based on uh, the specific data that I have here. Uh, whatever data has been trained on within my content here you can see here that I, I can ask questions regarding you see here that it's pulling based on the crypto miners you can also have some 
questions regarding the different things that you have here. So that's for the AI agent aspect of this. So they also have an a API where you can access and interact with your agent via an SDK or an API. So you can see here that they have one for Python, JavaScript, and obviously curl where you can do an, an API integration and do a post request to using this URL. So this AI agent is the ID specific to this AI agent and then this completion. And this gives you a return data example here that you're going to be expecting when you when you make a request to that endpoint. You can see here that the data that has been uh, sent back uh, when making the request is in accordance to the OpenAI specs. You can see here that the choices um, have a message and then it has the content and you can see here also as well. You can also see that uh, there's also some usage information such as what how many tokens was used and the completion tokens that were used and then you can see here that the total tokens that were used to create this response was 21 just for an example here but you can see here that you can use the api or you can interact with the AI agent in various ways using the api or you can use the sc to speed up that process so let's go ahead and jump into um, active pieces. Since we've already set up the uh, A table data sheet here, let's go ahead and jump into active pieces. So we're going to be using Google News as the news source for this RSS feed that we're going to be automating. So to keep things simple, instead of having to pay for another RSS feed aggregator such as RSS.app, which you can also use if you want to do a subscription. It's not that expensive, but we can use this for all kinds of different feeds that you want. You can use this for YouTube uh, and you can combine multiple feeds into one and you can do some automation on top of that, which is great. So instead of using that, we're going to be using Google News and we're going to be using the RSS feed for Google News. The main thing that we want to do here is we want to grab the RSS feed for Google News and that's what we're going to be using to do automation with. That's what we're going to be using to trigger our automation. Every time that we get a new news added to our RSS feed, we're going to be doing some automation uh, on top of that and grab the content. How are we going to do that with Google News? You can see here, there's really no straightforward way of getting the RSS feed for Google News. Obviously, we can do a simple Google it, and that's how we can grab the RSS feed. You can see here, there's really no option for RSS feed. So the best way to get the RSS feed for any news feed for any website uh, that you have in mind is to get an extension. So the extension that I recommend is get RSS feed URL, which you can get from the Google Chrome store which you can install and see how I have it installed. I also have it painted as part of my toolbar so you can have access to it whenever I need it. I can go back to Google News here. And once I type in, for instance, a subject such as artificial intelligence, I can go ahead and click on that RSS extension and it will just give me the RSS feed URL, which I can then go ahead and copy. So I can go ahead and paste that into a separate tab, which you can see here, it gives me the actual RSS feed URL, which I can work with inside of Active Pieces. So now I have that URL copied. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the possible articles that we're going to be scraping as part of this automation. So you can see here some of the articles that we're going to be possibly going to be scraping is inside of this paywall. You can see here that to access this article from New York Times, I basically need to create an account or I have to get a subscription in order for me to read this article. So that's one example. Another hurdle that we're going to be encountering is each website has its own layout. For instance, this one has this ads right here. As a lot of websites have this uh, list of articles on the right hand side and also the menus. So there's really no cookie cutter approach as to how to web scrape content from different sources, especially different websites. So especially articles such as article that's this where it's behind a paywall. So having to scrape this article is a little bit more complex just to keep our life simple we're going to be using firecrawl here which turns a website into LLM, llm ready data so we can easily web scrape the content of any website that we can imagine including the new york times article here and we can use firecrawl for that just up just for an example you see here the article that we we're just looking at for the art the new york times you can see here that the investors pour 27 0.1 billion into AI startups. So you can see here, just looking at it from here behind the paywall, you see here that there's really no other information that you can grab from article within, except for these two things right here, which is the title of the article and then the little description here underneath that. So if you can see here, Firecrawl was able to grab all this information. I'm going to read it briefly and just kind of give you an idea and sense of what this tool is capable of. 
since here the title of the article and then also the little description you can see here that it was able to scrape some other information as well and then just some information regarding some startups for two years many unprofitable tech startups have cut costs and sold themselves out of business so there's some reference here regarding this article and now the ai boom that started in day 2022 has become the, the strongest counterpoint to the broader startup called downturn so it was able to extract more content than what's available for us which is great so which is why we're going to be using farco for this we're able to do a web scroll for an entire website using using a single web source right here you can just pass in a single website it will scrape and go through all the different links within that website and it will give you a result in this array type of format where it'll give you the url and all the different pages within the url that you've given it and it's going to give you all the different contents that's available within that page so you can capture in the website as a whole or you can capture it on a per page basis and you have some samples here as well how to use it inside of python node or curl if you want to integrate your app within firecrawl you can use curl or you can use via a manual integration via an api or you can use python or node.js using their sdk so which i'm going to be showing you guys in a little bit how to use uh, we're not going to be using the sdk per se but i'm going to be showing you guys how to set this up using uh, using axios so Let's go ahead and jump into active pieces and let's go ahead and set this up. All right, let's go ahead and start off this automation by adding this uh, RSS feed trigger. We're going to go ahead and paste the URL that we generated from the previous uh, step when we received or when we generated the RSS feed URL using the extension. Let's go ahead and paste that here. And it's going to be a new feed, new item in feed uh, trigger in RSS feed. So once you have that URL in place, let's go ahead and load the data. So we have some sample data to work with. So let's go ahead and check this out. So you see here, there's there, there's a link right here where it's not really the link to the actual article, but instead this is a Google News redirect URL. So let's go ahead and examine this one. We see here that it goes to this page, which contains this information right here, which contains the URL, and then it goes to the actual article website. So that's what we're gonna do is the next step is we're gonna be grabbing the actual URL to that website, since that's not really the actual URL that we want. So the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding a code piece here. We're going to be adding a code by adding a code piece right here. And then we're going to be passing in the URL and that's the value. And we're going to be sending it to the, the link that we received from the RSS feed. And then we're going to be going into the code and then we're going to just go ahead and expand this one. There's two packages that we need to install in as part of this code. The first one is going to be the Cheerio, which we're going to be using to parse out and uh, get the content within the uh, the redirect body of the HTML, uh, which we're going to be grabbing from the, uh, the redirect website that Google News uh, has given us. So we're going to go and uh, retrieve the content from that re redirect uh, body, and then we're going to parse it out using Cheerio. Uh, and in order to reach out to that website, we're going to be using a package called Axios, which we're going to be using to make an HTTP request for that URL. All right, so two libraries so the next step is we're going to be dealing with the code inside the code is we're going to be in addition to the code that's been you know set for us by default uh, when we added a code piece we're going to be adding two lines here at the top which we're going to be uh, declaring to add a reference to axios which we're going to be referencing the axios object within the axios library and then we're also going to be referencing the cheerio from within cheerio library I'm going to declare a couple of functions here, which I'm going to be going through more in details. Let's go ahead and paste that here in the bottom. And I'm going to add a couple of things on the top. So the first thing we're going to do here. So when we first execute this code, it's going to go through and run this code function, which we're then we're going to be structuring the URL from inputs. So remember that we pass in the URL as part of this code. So that's going to be the actual redirect URL from Google. We're going to just pull it in and assign it to URL here. So once we have the URL, let's go ahead and grab the, the redirect body. We're going to be using this get from text URL, which takes in a URL, which we're going to be using Axios to do a request and get the body from that redirect website. So once we have loaded up the response, we're just going to pass in and assign the HTML of that response into an HTML variable here. 
Once we have the HTML available to us, we're going to go ahead and use Cheerio and assign and just load up the HTML that we receive and just going to assign it to a dollar sign here, constant. So once we get the HTML and we're able to load it up inside of Cheerio, the next line, line 19, is where we extract the body of the text. And then we're going to be setting it inside of this text body by using this dot text function, All right? So we're just going to grab everything, all the different contents and text within a body element. And then we're just going to set it right here as a text body. And then we're just going to return a text body as part of this function. Uh, we also wrapped this function inside a try catch, just in case there's an error that occurs, uh, we can capture that with the console error and then retry that exception. So once we got the get text from this URL, we're going to go ahead and and set it inside of this constant called redirect body, which can then con contains the actual HTML for the redirect body that we received. So next part of the code is to actually get the URL. So within the body that we extracted from the previous lines from the redirect body. So now that we actually got the HTML content of the actual redirect page, we can then go ahead and extract the actual URL for that website that we're trying to do a web scraping for. So let's go ahead and look into this function right here. So this one accepts a string of input, which we're then re going to be assigning to this actual URL. So we're going to be calling this function and we're doing an await on it since it's an async function. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's inside of this. So inside of this get URL up to word, we've declared a regex here where we're going to be doing a match on the string that we've received from the previous step. And we're just going to match uh, and find for anything that starts with an HTTP or HTTPS and ends when, with a window.wiz. So while I was doing some research and trying to extract information out of the redirect body, I was able to figure out a more consistent way of grabbing the, the URL from the body and I was able to extract it via a regex. So we're doing a match here on the input and we're try trying to match it and see if we can find anything that matches within the certain boundaries, right? So if it matches and the matches is length is greater than zero, then there's a match. That means what we're going to be returning the first result that we found and we're, we're going to be replacing the window that was with an empty string. So it's going to be either an HTTP or an HTTPS as the website could be in a non-secured URL or a secured URL. So we want to be able to grab and pull any of those type of websites and then anything that ends with window.wiz. So we're going to be returning that if it matches, otherwise it's going to be a null. And we're setting it as part of this actual URL here. And then from here, I can just return this actual URL if I want to. And then let's go ahead and format this document and do a test. So this could take you know a few seconds as the Axios will have to reach out and do an HTTP request on the redirect. And then we have to scrape it and then now we get the actual URL here and see here that this is the actual URL, which should match the URL that we end up going to after the redirect happens. So let's go back to active pieces. Let's go back and return this one. And this is going to be, we're going to be calling this get URL. So this is going to be the main responsibility of this code is to just get the URL from the redirect body. And then we can use it for any subsequent parts of this automation. So next thing that we're going to do is we want to do a, a web scraping using Firecall. So we're going to go ahead and declare a new code here, which we're going to be using code again. Mentioned, like I previously mentioned, the Firecall has some SDK, which I tried using, but had some issues when using it inside of the code here. So we're going to go ahead and just use uh, just a demand manual way of doing some integration, which we're going to be using Axios again and run some code and then make the HTTP request to Firecall API. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. So since we're using Firecall and it requires an API key, so I went ahead and added a get Firecall key here, uh, which I'm pulling it from a storage within across the different projects. So I stored the Firecall key API ahead of time, and then I'm doing a get here. So I'm not going to be showing uh, you the step here, but essentially I'm, I just did an insert or put on this key, and then I'm pulling that key inside my code so I can pass it in right here. I can go ahead and pass in my key right here, which I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can hide it. Fire call key, and then I'm gonna be pulling it from my storage, which hopefully it's invisible enough. So let's go ahead and 
another thing that we're going to also going to be passing in here is going to be the the url that we want to do a web scraping on which is the result from the previous step which is actually getting the url so let's go ahead and go back to that step and do a test here so now that we got the actual url let's go ahead and pass it in as part of a parameter for this code and let's go ahead and get the url the result so now that I have the fire call key and then the, the URL as part of this parameter, let's go ahead and expand, make this full screen. Okay. So for this particular code, I'm going to be using uh, Axios again to make the HTTP request to the fire call API. So let's go ahead and add the package for Axios and let's go back again to the code. So first thing we will be doing here is going to do an import Axios from Axios, right? So we're going to be pulling out that object. So then we can use that object within this code. And then we're going to be structuring the actual the URL and the fire call key, which I previously mentioned I've defined here. Just make sure that the spelling of your inputs matches whatever how you structure it in your code to match right here. And then I'm just declaring it as a constant within right within the code. The second thing that we're going to be declaring is the actual function to do the web scraping for. So I'm going to go ahead and copy some code here below it. So this is going to be the web scraping URL, which I'm going to be doing in a way here. So I'm going to replace the return true and I'm going to be returning the result of that scrape URL. So two things that we're going to be passing in as part of this function is it accepts a URL and the key for fire call. So let's go ahead and break this code down. Let's go ahead and do a format. So I'm doing a return of anything that I receive back from this function when I call this function. So I'm doing an await for this function and passing the URL and the fire call key. I'm setting up an options right here for Axios, which is which contains a, a method of post. And then specifically, I'm using this URL to do a web scraping for. And then I'm, I'm essentially I'm passing in uh, the key as part of the header. So I'm doing authorization, authorization bearer, and then I'm passing in the key as part of the headers. And then I'm using a content type of application for slash JSON as that's the type of content type that we're expecting to receive. And then in addition to this, we're also passing in the, da the data that contains an object of URL, which we're passing in right here. So if you want to uh, pass in uh, the entire website, then we have to uh, construct it in a way where we will receive an array of URL and contents. Since we're only scraping for a single URL, uh, this is how we create the objects to make the request for this particular endpoint. So this is how you construct the data and it's going to have an object of URL, right? But within this, we're going to be wrapping the actual execution of the Axios to do a post method inside of a try catch, just in case something happens. In which case, if there's an error, we're just going to return an empty string. If not, then we're just going to go ahead and just capture the response and the response is always going to be inside of the data. So the data within Axios always lives in this dot data and in this property. We're just going to go ahead and return that. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and format this real quick and let's go out and let's go ahead and test this step. See if it's working. All right. So took a few seconds, but we got the records that we needed. Like in their documentation, I've stated you're going to get the success to true. And then you're also going to get the data with the content or a markdown. So whatever type of data you, you prefer to work with either the actual content or the markdown. I think it's very similar anyways. It doesn't really matter in our case, but it also includes a title and some of the metadata information such as description for that particular web page. So it also includes the return code 200 and some other meta information such as the URL and so forth. So now we have the actual uh, content that we can work with. So we can call this web scrape URL with Firecrawl just to be more specific as to what we're doing in this code since we're doing multiple codes here. All right, so the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to make determining whether the the result that we get back from, from Firecrawl is successful or not. So we're going to do a simple check here. We're going to do add a branch and we're just going to determine whether that the result that we get is true. All right, so we're going to do a Boolean is true. And if it's true, then we can go ahead and proceed with doing additional testing. Do we have any content? Essentially, what it is, right? So we have any content, and then if it's true, then we're going to go ahead and proceed with the automation. 
So the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be extracting some information within the article or within the content. Since it's not a perfect article or summary content, we're just going to go ahead and use AI to even refine the content that we receive back from Firecrawl and before we insert it inside of a table. So let's go ahead and add a secondary step here or a step after we've determined that there's a content by adding Straco. So we're going to go ahead and use Straco here and then I'm going to be using Ask AI and then using my Straco connection. And this time we're going to be using, I think 4.0, uh, GPT 4.0 might be good for this one. I'm just going to go ahead and copy a prompt. Okay, so here's the prompt that I have here and we have to make sure that the script, web script data is coming from uh, Firecrawl here. So let's go ahead and insert within the double quotes. I'm going to go ahead and insert the data that we receive. I'm just going to use and use the, uh, the content here. So I have the prompt right here where it says act as a data extraction specialist. Your task is to parse article content from web script data. The goal is to provide only the relevant article content while ex excluding any unnecessary information such as ads, navigation bars, sidebars. So we're just going to grab just the main content information. So sometimes Firecall or any of the web scraping tools that you use, they tend to also include some information that are not really relevant to the article, such as the banner information, such as the ads such as the link information. So we want to make sure that we get rid of all this, those information and we're adding a prompt here to just essentially just extract the key information that we need just for that article. So in this case, we want to only want to extract the article and then we're passing in the var variables, which we are setting the context for, which is going to be the result that we get back from Firecall data. Right, so we're gonna go ahead and execute this. So what it does is it, essentially the AI is just gonna clean this up and it's just gonna remove anything that doesn't really pertain to the article. So let's go ahead and expand this one so you can kind of see the content, have an idea. So there's some line breaks in between, but there's some articles. So this is perfect. And it's gonna rename this to extract details from the article because essentially that's what it is. So the last step that we're gonna be doing here is we're gonna be inserting the records inside of a table. All right, so we're gonna be uh, grabbing a table here and then we're going to be creating a record inside a table and then using that connection and the space we're going to be using the same AI news data sheet that we, we've been using in this tutorial and then we're going to be passing in the title so the title can come in from the actual rss feed which is the vt professor using computer and then the source source url would be the actual url that we extracted when when we record the redirect website for google so we're just going to go ahead and extract, get the real URL and not the redirect URL. And the date publish is going to be automatically added for us inside of a table since we've automatically set that to automatically be added when we create a new record. And then lastly here, we're going to be adding the content, which is the result that we get from a table. So let's go ahead and test this step. And let's go back to a table. You see here at the bottom, we added the 57th record here. You see here the title. It's going to expand this one and see everything. So it has here the title, it has the URL, and it has the date publish, which is the current date and the time, and also the content, right? So it has this a Virginia Tech professor is using computer games, a common hobby for many across the United States, to enhance uh, cybersecurity and artificial, artificial intelligence. You see here that you can kind of go through this article, right? You can see the details of this article and including the actual formatting, the line breaks in between, and you can go back to the article. So, which is pretty lengthy. It kind of gives us a little bit of summary. You can now use this to do, uh, if you're repurposing this content for a newsletter or or whatever, you're trying to keep up with a news stuff or whatever news articles that you're trying to keep up with, this could be something that's handy for you. So that's that for this video. So if you're new to the channel and you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and hit subscribe. If you like this type of content, like always hit like on this video. And if there's any tutorial that you'd like me to do in the future, please go ahead and leave it in the comments. I read every single uh, one of your comments. So please go ahead and drop a like and I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.